Hello and welcome to the channel where in this video we'll talk about how to deal with North Korea. The Financial Times recently came out with a big read on North Korea. There are many points of interest in the article and let's unwrap a few of those. Because why not? The first bit that catches the eye are the words North Korea. It is pure gold in terms of reader attention. I'll posit that North Korea has the same magnetism, attraction as Apple and Steve Jobs and the interesting bit is that the newspapers know it. That could also be one of the reasons why I am talking about this madcap place, even though it may not have any material impact on your daily lives. Yes, I am not averse to playing that game either. What can I say other than, hello YouTube? With that out of the way, the other thing that catches the eye in that article is a US government staffer calling Kim a rabbit. Here's Sidney Seiler, the National Intelligence Officer for North Korea at the US Office of the Director of National Intelligence. We've arranged the carrots in different ways in different administrations. But all we've learnt is that Kim Jong-un is not a rabbit. Maybe that is how foreign policy works, because it is complicated and frustrating to deal with leaders of such faraway places and such diverse cultures and such varied political inclinations. People's goals almost never align, and there are always points of friction, even among those nations which are otherwise the best of friends. That is to say that it can be a hard job. It seems that one of the ways to make it easier is to trick your brain into simplifying human beings as animals. You, good sir, are a crocodile and henceforth all our strategies and plans with regards to you and your people will be made keeping that in mind. I mean, it can be easier to make plans for crocodiles than for people but I am not sure they'll work very well. Also the fact that the person who is supposed to be a crocodile may not be entirely enthused by being called a croc. But what do I know? The other thing that catches the eye is how well China is dealing with the madman, Kim Jong-un. China is the closest to the danger, other than South Korea of course, and may have decided that it makes sense to be in the madman's good books. That keeps uncertainty down and costs in check. You don't have to have a heavy deployment of troops and equipment near the North Korean border because the army is expensive. Perhaps give some rice and a Mercedes from time to time, or send some movies and wine his way. If he wants to come over for a visit once in a while, send someone important, but not too important, to go meet with him so that he doesn't feel ignored. Generally keep him in good humor. Much easier to manage that way. Contrast that with South Korea's experience which couldn't be more different. There may be valid reasons for it, but nevertheless. The third thing which catches the eye is how anemic the partial lifting of sanctions feel, at least from the point of view of the mad dictator. We learn in the article that specific steps might include a limited reopening of trade and potentially raising the international cap on oil imports. A barter arrangement could also be offered to allow Pyongyang to export some commodities in exchange for food or medicine, and small-scale inter-Korean economic projects could be restarted. Kim Jong-un is getting not even peanuts. The key concern seems to be the presence of nuclear weapons. Lifting sanctions in any meaningful way will put money into the hands of the dictator who has nukes to play with, and there are a million reasons why that is a terrible idea. There seems to be no way to constrain the North Korean government without harming the people. The lowering of sanctions, as proposed, does not help the people much. In fact, it may harm the regime if it makes the people better off without really benefiting the regime itself. And the sanctions, as they are currently, do not seem to inconvenience the dictator much. So we carry on with the status quo. Just a wild thought. Why not work with China here? They seem to have figured it out somewhat. The final thing that I want to talk about, that caught my eye, are the North Korean defectors in South Korea who are helping others to defect. Sokil Park, Director of Liberty in North Korea, a group that helps North Koreans defect and resettle in South Korea, says sanctions, including the ban on foreign workers, weaken the chances of change inside North Korea. The first thought that comes to mind is, good job. Well done to Sokil Park. He is doing a great job. Maybe more of that please. 
The next thought that comes to mind is that we are indulging in a bit of double standards here. I mean, there has to be. Think about all the people trying to defect from North Africa and parts of the Middle East into Europe, who are not having a good time of it. Many die and even those who do make it to the other side, face tremendous challenges. A common thread that emerges from time to time are the middle men who can charge exorbitant amounts to arrange the logistics. The travel arrangements aren't the most luxurious and many people do not survive on their way to Europe. There are similar experiences for people trying to cross into the USA from South and Central America. Those middlemen, who are making the arrangements and taking care of logistics for migrants into Europe and USA are not always portrayed in a good light in media stories. In fact, they are much maligned. Contrast that with portrayal of the North Korean defectors who are helping other North Koreans to defect. From the point of view of the defectors, the middlemen are trying to help, be it in North Korea or North Africa or Central America. Maybe the middlemen are providing a valuable service to those who are suffering. Maybe it is our perspective which changes from one case to another, making the middlemen in America and Europe the villains, while those in Korea the heroes. Okay, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. If so, please give a like and I'll see you in the next one.